day 155 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Well, back into the book of Proverbs once again, gaining some more wisdom, always a good place to be on a Tuesday if you are studying with us in real time. Welcome back to Bible Study Friends. If you are part of the Heart Die Fam or if you're a Bible Study Friend, BSF, hit that like button for us. That is your roll call button saying we partner with you, Kanoi. We are here with you and we believe in what we are doing here in this ministry to get people excited about God's Word. And if you are new here, we welcome you. Please let us know in the comments where you are watching from. And don't forget to check out the show notes or the description box because we've got lots of information in there for you. And if you have any questions, you may be able to find the answers there first, or you can go to our website, heartdive.org. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and get right into it. So let's pray and prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this ministry. Thank you for every person who is here. I just pray right now, Lord, that you will allow our hearts to be still before you. We humble ourselves before you. We silence all distractions. We just ask that you will please bring rest and peace into our hearts and minds right now so that as we open up your word, we are able to partake of it, Lord, and to be able to hear the specific message that you have for us. We know that you've already carved out this time. It's already on your calendar. It is not by accident that we are here. And so we believe and we trust that you are going to do something powerful while we are here today. We thank you, Lord, that as we come together, together in unity, that there is going to be a blessing that is commanded upon this place. And so I just pray right now that you help us to get out of the way so that you can come in and infiltrate and do what you need to do. Take up every single space in our hearts, in our spirits, and in our minds. We don't want to be the ones who stand in the way of that. So forgive us, Lord, if we have done that. Forgive us if we have stopped short. Forgive us if we've crossed over the line. Show us, God, where we are unaware of our own sin. We want to be able to live lives that are honorable and in obedience to you because we know that when we do that, that is living by the wisdom that you were telling us to get today. And so I pray that that will be the case, that we will store this up into our hearts and value it for the treasure that it is. We thank you for this time. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to forgive others. And I just pray that you will be blessed today, Lord, in our obedience and coming to you and seeking you out. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're starting off here in chapter four. This is Solomon writing to his son. But of course, we look at this in the spiritual sense as our heavenly father writing to his children. So we're going to take gender out of the equation and say, this is our God speaking to us. Verse one, hear, O sons, a father's instruction and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. Verse three, when I was a son with my father, meaning David, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, meaning Bathsheba, he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast to my words, keep my commandments and live. So David knew that this was a life and death situation. Keeping the commandments and the word of God would either bring life or death if you were to disobey. And they saw that with their own eyes. And when he says, let your heart hold fast, he's appealing to the heart first. And the reason why is because out of the heart flows the wellsprings of life. It starts in the heart first. And so he's trying to cultivate a receptive heart so that it wouldn't fall on deaf ears. Verse five, get wisdom. Get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Now, this word get is the Hebrew word, and I don't know how to say it. It's Q-A-N-A. I don't know if that's kana, kwana. I'm not sure. But it really just means to buy something, to purchase it. And so that's interesting because when you think about purchasing wisdom, that means that it's going to cost something. Whenever you choose to be wise, it is going to cost your own ego. It is going to cost your pride. You are going to have to put other other things to the side, to forsake all other things in order to live that life of wisdom. And it's usually something that is worth getting rid of. So don't feel bad about it. But again, he is stressing here that it takes effort to be able to get that wisdom. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her and she will guard you. So whenever you hold that wisdom close to your heart, it will protect and guide you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Well, 
isn't that profound. So in other words, this should be your first choice. The same way that it was for Solomon, whenever he was offered one wish in that dream, he chose wisdom. And whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. So whenever you act wisely, and this is a really good thing to think about because anytime you're faced with a decision or if you're about to do something, ask the simple question, is this wise? And I think that will help to kind of snap you out of your feelings and back to the reality of things, the spiritual aspect of it. And that will lead to that higher ground, that honor. She will place on your head a graceful garland and she will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Hear my son and accept my words that the years of your life may be many. So we can hear Solomon renewing his appeal now to his son. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. And if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it turn away from it and pass on. So don't even take the first step. Because remember, walking into sin is a progression. You don't fall, you take a step and then you take another step and eventually you find yourself sitting in it and completely underwater. Verse 16, for they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. Now, while it is really easy to think that this is speaking only of people on the outside who are doing wicked things over there, this could very well be our own friends and family who lead us down the wrong paths. And because they are so close to us, we tend to overlook their offenses or their behaviors, or we'll just write them off as, well, that's just the way they are. But if we're going to be dining at the same table with them, we better recognize what they're reaching for to satisfy them. So here Solomon says that sin is their food and drink meaning they can't find satisfaction unless they're doing something wrong. So they will bite out of the bread of foolishness. They will drink from the cup of contention and fighting. So heart check, what cup and loaf are you reaching for? What about those around you? What satisfies your hunger and thirst? Verse 18, but the path of righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. So when you're walking down that road to righteousness, the path of the righteous, it's only going to continue to get brighter and brighter. There's not going to be burnout if you make wise decisions. Burnout only comes whenever you make unwise decisions. Stay within the light. The way of the wicked is like deep darkness. On the other hand, they do not know over what they stumble. So here we have that contrast of the two different paths. So if you go down the path of wisdom, it's a straight path. It's safe. It is unencumbered. It is light. And from it, you will be exalted, honored, and you will have long life and promise. And then the path of the wicked, it is crooked, dangerous, hazardous, violent, dark, and you will end up stumbling around and eventually in a pit of destruction. Verse 20, my son, be attentive to my words. So pay attention. Incline your ear to my my saying, so make sure you're listening. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. So hold fast to them, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. So you can think of wisdom like medicine for heart disease, at least spiritual heart disease. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the wellsprings of life or the springs of life. So this is that guard your heart. Keep it steady. Have that constancy. Put away from you crooked speech and put deviant talk from you. And if you guard your heart properly, you will be able to do this easily because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you're guarding your heart from what comes in and also what comes out, you will be able to easily put away that crooked speech and devious talk. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Now, this one always checks my heart because I have a monkey mind and everything I see is like a banana tree. I mean, I just have this vigor for life. I want to see it all. I want to do it all. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it can be if I allow those bananas to distract me from my purpose. So in a sense, 
I have to put on horse blinders so that I will keep moving forward rather than being like squirrel with every single thing to the left and right of me. Because if I do that, eventually I'm going to completely get off course because of all of the detours that I'm taking. So heart check. Are you easily distracted? Do you need to put on blinders so you keep looking forward? So Solomon has given us a lot of practical instruction here. He says, listen to your parents, get wisdom, don't forget it, guard it, turn from sin, guard your heart vigilantly, watch your mouth, set goals, remove distractions. And lastly, he says, watch your step. And I think that that's pretty profound that he ended on that because where you step determines where you're going to end up going. So again, you're not falling into sin, you're walking into it. So heart check. Where are you stepping? Which path are you heading down? Chapter five, my son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. All right, so we're gonna stop here once again because even though we're talking about an adulterous woman, we've gotta keep it within the context and remember, okay, this is Solomon speaking to his son. So of course he's gonna talk about an adulterous woman. He's not gonna mention a man, but this is applicable to women as well in speaking of an adulterous man or anybody who is going to try to lure you into sin. So these kinds of people, they will speak Speak words that sound really sweet and they will be smooth talkers. So they're not going to sit there and cut you down in the beginning. We talked about this yesterday. No, they are going to love bomb you. They're going to build you up. They're going to make you feel real good with the words that they speak. So we have to guard our conversations with people, especially people of the opposite sex or people who you may be attracted to. Because even though it starts off innocent, even though you can say to yourself, I just appreciate their beauty or we're just chatting, we're just having innocent conversation. It can quickly turn into something else and really quickly do that. It can quickly turn into something else because the more that you spend time with them, that attraction is only going to grow. Verse four, but in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. So in the end, you're gonna end up with a bad taste in your mouth and it's gonna hurt. And it's sharp as a two-edged sword because it will kill. It will kill marriages. It will kill relationships. It will kill your reputation, the honor that you once had, your prestige, your position, the security you once felt, your identity. I mean, it is deadly. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander and she does not know it. And guess what? If you walk down that road with her, you're not going to know it either. And the reason why is because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if you are now treasuring this time with them, treasuring this relationship with them, you're eventually going to get to that place where you think that you are in love with them. They get me. And then the less you are going to treasure your spouse, because remember, you can't serve two masters. And that is why there is such an emphasis on this faithfulness in marriage. So stay awake. Verse seven, and now, O sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near to the door of her house as much as you're going to want to. Don't do it. Don't drop into the DMs. Lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life, you groan. When your flesh and body are consumed and you say how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof, I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. So if you go down this road, it is going to lead to a loss of honor, time, strength, wealth, because hello, divorce is expensive, dignity, confidence, even your health, because it will weigh on you in your mind and in your spirit, and even your focus. And of course, they say that hindsight is 2020. Like you can see a whole lot clearer whenever you're in that stage of regret way up there and looking back. But by that time, there is no going back to get the advice that you ignored. And the reason that this happens is because once that desire sets in, the need for gratification is gonna trump the desire for advice. That is why if you ever try to give advice to somebody who's already going down that road, they're not gonna hear it. They may act like they're hearing it, but 
their heart is not hearing it. And this is why Solomon is warning his son to know this and to have a plan should he ever face these temptations. Because we can easily say, oh, I would never. But I guarantee you, Every single person who committed adultery said the same thing at one point. So we are not exempt from this. So heart check. Do you have a plan for how you would react to temptation? Verse 15, drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? Okay, so going back to the cisterns and wells. Back in this day, a family's well was their most prized possession because this was their source of life. It was considered a crime if you took water from another person's well, just as it was considered a crime to sleep with someone else's spouse. And that is what this is speaking of. Whenever he says to drink from your own well, he is saying, don't try to go and get satisfaction elsewhere. Their well may look cleaner, the grass may seem greener, but I assure you it isn't. So our check, are you watering your own grass and drinking from your own well? Or are you looking at someone else's property? And by the way, this can also include looking at things like pornography, because when you do that, it's like you are needing something else to satisfy you and you are not rejoicing in the wife of your youth. Okay, so intimacy within marriage is not intended to be boring or mechanical. It is for pleasure and enjoyment. It is a good thing but to be enjoyed between the two people. Carry on. For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. So even if your sin isn't exposed to the world, God sees it. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. Now, what I find interesting is that here we have this guy who had 700 wives and 300 concubines warning against adultery talking about the importance of honoring this one person within your marriage, and we just got to take from it what we can get. But at the same time, I think that he is able to speak on this because he gets himself. He knows what the desire for many women has done to his life. And one of the reasons why the Bible does talk about this and does emphasize it is because of the fact that it is one of the hardest things to be able to resist, but also come back from. And we talked a little bit about it yesterday, but if you look at the most powerful instincts and needs of a human being, the very first one is the need for air. It's an involuntary thing. It is automatic for us to need air and to get air. Our bodies simply breathe whether we are sleeping or wide awake. The second thing is the need for food and water. It's that survival instinct. And it is necessary to be able to live. And so even though it is voluntary in your eating and drinking, that need is so powerful that you're going to do anything you can to be able to satisfy it. And then the third need or instinct is the need for elimination to let go of waste. And so that, again, is a required or necessary thing to be able to live because you know if you ever have any sort of backup that is not good in your body. And it also at some point becomes involuntary. But the fourth thing, the most powerful instinct and need of a human being, number four, is the sex drive. And unlike the other three, this is something that can be controlled. This is something that is voluntary. This is something that requires discipline. And it's really hard because when you've got two people now who have this powerful instinct and need coming together, it becomes like a magnet and it's so hard to tear apart. It's so hard to keep apart because it wants to attract to one another. And so this is one of the areas where our character is tested in the greatest way. Chapter six, now we have some practical warnings from Solomon to his son. My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, have given your pledge for a stranger, if you are snared in the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself. For you have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go, hasten, and plead urgently with your neighbor. 
Now, this is not implying that we should not be generous or lend to those in need. What this is speaking of is overextending yourself or making a commitment that you cannot keep. So this can be applied to life in general and not just money because a lot of us are people pleasers. We have a really hard time saying no. And because so, we end up saying yes to everything else while saying no to what is most important. And the Lord is still working on me with this one. You know, every single day I am faced with prioritizing what is most important. And as much as I want to be there for every single person and do all the things, I simply cannot. And the Lord will literally tell me, put it down. He did that the other day whenever I was studying Psalm 119 and it was my daughter's birthday. I didn't want to let you guys down, but I also realized I would be letting my little girl down if I did not stop. So heart check. Do you overextend yourself? Do you need to work on prioritization and making wise commitments? Now, on the flip side of that, verse four, give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. Now, this makes me wonder how many ants they had hanging around for them to be able to go and observe. I mean, we had a lot of ants in Hawaii. It's kind of one of the costs of living in paradise. If you live there, you know what I'm talking about. But it still gives me the heebie-jeebies to think about. But regardless, ants are really fascinating. I mean, they're these laborious creatures. And to watch them, it's pretty incredible because they are so organized. They obviously don't need to be told what to do. You know, they just take initiative. They are cooperative. I mean, if you see them hand things off to one another, it's crazy. So they work together and they all are doing it for this one purpose. And it's like they know their job and they're just there to get it done. So in other words, they have the best work ethic. So heart check, what is your work ethic like? Verse nine, how long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep and a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. So here Solomon gives this warning against laziness. Now, this is not in direct opposition to rest because there is obviously a time for that, but he is saying that we need to know the proper season for rest and for work. And whenever it's time to work, we've got to use our time and our energy wisely the way that the ant does. And again, this one cuts right into the marrow of my bones because once I am done with 12 hours of Bible studying, I'm on the struggle bus. I mean, the last thing I want to do is fold laundry, clean dishes, go grocery shopping, and let alone be an Uber driver for my children. But I have to look at this for the season that it is because I know that this won't last forever. And I will regret it if I spend my time looking at social media, taking a nap whenever I could have been spending time with my kids that I know I won't always have. So heart check. Do you know your seasons? Are you spending your time and energy wisely within them? Verse 12, a worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks in his eyes, signals with his feet, and points with his finger. With perverted heart, devises evil, continually sowing discord. So basically, these are schemers. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond healing. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. So notice the progression here. We're going from six to seven, and we're going to go from bad to worst. And so an abomination, that's the strongest form of revulsion in the Bible. So start here in verse 17, haughty eyes, or those who look proudly, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among his brothers. And all of these things before the sowing discard is going to ultimately lead to division, to a person wanting to be contentious. But isn't that interesting that the seventh, the worst thing that the Lord hates 
is those who sow discord, those who are here to divide. I mean, it makes sense because that's what the devil is here to do. So if you're coming at people with constant criticism, constant contention, constantly trying to attack, and you aren't doing so with this desire to be able to speak truth in love, mercy and truth together, you might want to check your heart because that's something that the Lord hates. Verse 20, my son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always, so that's for the rest of your life, tie them around your neck. And when you walk, they will lead you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk with you. So not only our parents' words, but of course, we're speaking of our father's words. And whenever we store those things up in our hearts, when we take the advice that our parents gave to us, the wise advice, and when we take the word of God and we keep it close to our hearts, they will lead us, they will protect us, and it will literally be our counselor. It will talk with us whenever we are facing issues. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light. And of course, this goes right along with the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And the reproofs of discipline are the way of life to preserve you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress. Do not desire her beauty in your heart and do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. So this speaking of that seducing or that seduction. So it always starts with one look, remember, starts with the eyes, then it becomes a thought, then it becomes an action. I mean, we're thinking about everything that happened with David and Bathsheba. Remember when we went through that progression of sin? For the price of a prostitute is only a loaf of bread, but a married woman hunts down a precious life. Now, these are both wrong. This is not saying, go ahead and spend your loaf of bread on a prostitute as long as you're not touching an adulteress. No, this is just saying that the cost that comes with an adulteress is much worse. Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So in other words, if you are going to be near fire and play with fire, you're going to get burned. Don't even play with the smoke. Don't even go near it is what Solomon was saying. And the scary thing is, is that, yeah, unbelievers can play with fire and get burned, but believers who play with fire are going to get doubly burned and be doubly accountable because of the the fact that you knew better. You knew you should not have gone there. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his appetite when he is hungry. But if he is caught, he will pay sevenfold. He will give all the goods of his house. So again, this is not condoning thievery or theft. But what it is saying is that, okay, we get it when a hungry man steals. That makes sense. But he who commits adultery, verse 32, lacks sense, and he who does it destroys himself. So that is much worse because it doesn't make sense. It is not one of those survival things that you need. It isn't air, and it isn't food, and it isn't water. Yeah, it may be driven by that powerful sex drive, but it is not a necessity. And sadly, he will end up destroying himself, whether caught or not, because there will be a breakdown within the spirit and in the mind. Verse 33, he will get wounds and dishonor and his disgrace will not be wiped away. For jealousy makes a man furious and he will not spare when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation and he will refuse though you multiply gifts. And this isn't only speaking of the husband of the wife. This includes all people because for some reason, people have a really hard time forgiving adultery. Even if it's not of their spouse, they can look at somebody else and see them. And even though that person has repented, that person has asked for forgiveness, that person has been restored, it's a really hard for people to be able to let that go and to take that vision of the scarlet letter on on top the forehead away. They'll have it in their minds, once a cheater, always a cheater. But grace has to apply on an adulterer as well. So let's take a look at some of our deep dive questions. How can we guard our heart in practical ways? If we are to look straight ahead, what are some of the things that may be to the left and to the right of us? What would looking to the side imply? How might wisdom and understanding protect against immoral temptations? What role would we serve in this protection? 
How can we take marital advice from a man who had 700 wives and 300 concubines? And how can we find the balance between proper rest and laziness? And then look at the seven things God detests. Why did He choose those seven to highlight? What might they lead to? So Heavenly Father, we thank You for another rich reading of timeless wisdom. We see the importance of pursuing it, understanding it, and also applying it so that we will be able to navigate this crazy life with firm footing. So we thank You, Father, for continuing to instruct us today through Your Holy Spirit. We are so grateful for the way that You speak to us through Your Word, in Your Spirit, and through others. So I pray that whenever we hear a divine truth or promise or encouragement, even correction, that we won't forsake it, but store it up in our hearts and bind it around our necks so that we will never stray from it. We know that your word is the very thing that gives us life and sustains us. It does not lead us astray, nor does it ever run out of its life-changing power. So may we hold fast to it all the days of our lives. And if we ever start to wander down the crooked path or follow after those who might take us there, will you nudge us back to your way? We don't want to stammer and stumble through this life. So may we keep hold of the reins that you have given to us. And I pray that we will guard your instructions and guard our hearts by looking for the road that is well lit. Dark roads lead to no place good. So continue to be that light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter as we look to you. And if there is any crooked speech within us, Lord, will you wash our mouth out with your living water? I pray that we will put away any kind of talk that is dishonoring to you. May we pay mind to our future, looking ahead, thinking about the steps that we need to take so that when we come to a crossroads, we will be well prepared in which way to go. And if there are any distractions to the right or to the left, be our horse blinders that keep us focused and diligent in running this race toward your promise. And Lord, will you keep us from temptation? We know that it is unavoidable, but we also know that you always give us a way out. So help us to zone in on the escape hatch and quickly run to it when we see it. I pray that when we do face this, it will always lead us back home to you. And whenever we get there, let us turn on the garden hose and water our own grass rather than looking over at someone else's property, thinking that their lawn looks so much better than ours and help us to appreciate what we have before we insult you in saying that what you've given us is not good enough. Help us to know our boundaries and our seasons so that we can be a blessing to others without overextending ourselves and so that we will work hard while we have the time and energy to do so. Please give us proper rest and may we not crave sleep beyond that. Give us the energy that we need to take on our daily work, and I pray that we will do it with joy, for in doing so, we will reflect your glory to the world. That is what we want to do, and so let it be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I wanna be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna end up after I die, but I don't wanna live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're gonna say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven, of all my sins. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior 
and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.